This is the On The Mark Podcast, bringing you facts, opinions, and personal experiences from the outdoor industry. Um, I got the opportunity to shoot an AR-15. That was one of the funnest experiences that I've had. It's, it's pretty exciting. It's a, it's a big rush. Presented by Sightmark, an industry leader in optics, bore sights, night vision, and more. Make your mark. Today... We're going to take a trip to bear country. We're going to venture on up to Oregon. We're going to be talking to Tyler Tiller with Timber Creek Outdoors. Now, Tyler does a whole lot of bear hunting, elk hunting. Um, He even does some Africa hunts. So Tyler is kind of going to give us some insight on, you know, hunting some bigger game. Um, And frankly, it's, it's some game that a lot of people don't have the opportunities to hunt, or maybe they've always wanted to and just didn't know where to even start. Um, Tyler, before we get into the hunting side of things, I want to talk about Timber Creek Outdoors um, and, and just you and your background. Give us a little bit of information about you. How, What makes Tyler Tyler, and how would you get started with Timber Creek Outdoors? Yeah, um, I mean, what, what makes Tyler Tyler is is my folks and, and my God and my family. Um, but kind of expanding on that, we, we've had a family business uh, that my dad started uh, in the seventies and, um, it was primarily plastic injection molding. And so just various plastic parts. Um, and then my dad, uh, started making plastic parts for a, a company called Botech, an archery oh, yeah. company out in Oregon. Yeah. Uh, and shortly after that, my dad became a partner in the company and we were, were heavily involved in Botech. Um, in the early 2000s. And um, after my family was no longer involved in Botech, it was kind of that, you know, what's next thing. Sure. And we still had our, our injection molding shop. We still had our CNC shop and um, making gun parts kind of just fell into our lap. And uh, Timber Creek Outdoors was born with our accessory line. Very nice. Yeah. And so you guys uh, are a manufacturer of AR accessories, basically, right? Like you have your, you have build kits and and stuff like that, but we're not, you're not manufacturing full firearms per se, right? Just uh, accessories and parts and upgrades and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. So it's all the aftermarket upgrades, uh, almost all the parts, not all of them, but the majority of them are are CNC machined aluminum parts uh, that we then anodize or Cerakote and have uh, a wide variety of colors um, to really just customize your firearm. And the majority of our accessories are for the ARs or the the modern sporting rifles. Um, But we've been getting into some other platforms and we're starting to have some accessories for some rifles. Um, And in the coming years, we're really branching out. Um, I have some new things for SHOT Show coming up uh, with some Timber Creek flavor on some different platforms. Oh, nice. Yeah, hopefully we, uh, hopefully I get to see you at SHOT Show. We're pretty excited about finally getting back out into the show industry with (laughs) this, this COVID hit. Hopefully this, uh, this new flare up everybody's getting freaked out about doesn't get us all shut down again but um uh, you know we're timber creek uh right now is in the the heat of show season so we just had our first show uh down in arizona we have two more shows coming up in texas and then another one in nevada nice uh, so right now we're we're busy traveling around and hitting up shows yeah same with us I, we've got i'm actually this weekend um and by this weekend i mean i guess tomorrow because today's thursday tomorrow i'm going to be headed to uh, fort worth to texas trophy hunters um and again that's another one that i've really enjoyed um and i'm just happy to get back out there like i'm just so thrilled to get back to normal life um, right. but uh how, how how has Timber Creek been doing with you know just the everybody flooding to the firearms market? Whether they're buying, a, you know, a gun, a pistol for self defense, or maybe they're running out and buying that semi automatic AR fifteen because you know they're worried they're going to be banned. My guess is. If I'm an outsider looking in, I'm saying there's probably a whole lot of people running out, buying whatever is on the shelf at Academy, whatever last black AR is hanging up, and then afterwards looking for a way to upgrade that. Have you seen that effect come through on your side where, you know, business has just kind of skyrocketed with all that? Yeah, I mean, the last uh, eight, 
15 or so months for the entire industry across the board has been, you know, absolutely insane. Um, the number of new gun owners out there um, is is a phenomenal number. Tons of new people are, are buying firearms and um, seeing the value of owning a firearm. And it, at one point, you know, maybe about a year ago, people were just buying whatever was on the shelf. Um, I think the market's stabilized a little bit more now. Uh, You do have all the new gun owners or all those people that went out. Maybe they weren't a new gun owner, but bought a new gun. Right. And now uh, they are starting to accessorize. And, but industry wide, it didn't matter if you made a holster or a a scope or a gun accessory or ammo or the actual firearm. I mean, I don't know uh, another time that, that we saw that that extreme rush. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and we we experienced it here with uh, you know our optics. I mean, we were backlogged like crazy, and just from the sheer volume of new people coming in, and you know whether it was anything from our lower end optics or brands uh, all the way up to our higher ends. I mean, everything was just uh, completely backlogged with orders. And um, anyway. You know, I think the industry as a whole is kind of starting to get back up underneath themselves and, and kind of get all these orders caught back up and kind of catch, you know, everything back up to where, um, you know, not everything is completely backlogged all the time. Um, I mean, hell, even even the academy down the road here, they got in a shipment of ammo Wednesday, which ammunition's a total different monster, I know, but uh, they got a shipment of ammunition in yet. Uh, Wednesday, and it almost uh, it almost looked like pre pandemic. I mean, they had not they had uh, now prices were still freaking stupid, but they actually had stuff on the shelves, which was good to see. Yeah, well, you know, uh, Timber Creek kind of hangs their hat on a few things. One of them is all of our color options. Uh, another one is you know the U.S. made products. But the one that's really important to us and our sales team um, is our delivery to our dealers. And, you know, we, the majority of our business is sending those parts out to our dealer network uh, and the independent gun shops and and the different partners we have. Um, And we always pride ourselves on same day shipping or next day shipping. You know, a a dealer calls us and places an order, we're gonna get it out to them right away. And and through that pandemic, you know, we even got months behind, Uh, but we are through it and we're sitting now at a point where we're back to that. Uh, same day or next day uh, shipping and you know they're through our whole product line there might be a couple products that are back ordered but as a whole uh, we're able to fulfill our customers needs right now and um, it's a real good feeling to have the products on the shelf and be able to send them out to people when they need it yeah absolutely absolutely um now you interestingly enough you are friends with austin roar with superior outfitters right yeah well yeah I had him on the podcast a, a few episodes ago, and uh, that's where I found that out. He kind of mentioned that you guys took a trip over to Africa at one point, which I'll ask you about later on. But uh, how do you know Austin? Because Austin's all the way down here in Texas, um, and you're up there in Oregon. What? How's the? What's the connection there? How'd you guys meet? Yeah, so um, we are a vendor um, for a buy group called Nation's Best Sports, gotcha. um, and. Austin with Superior Firearms is a member of that buy group. Uh, so the first time I met Austin was down there in Fort Worth at the convention center at, at one of those nation's best sports shows. And uh, he, we were a young company. We were a new vendor, um, you know, probably had five or 10 employees. And Austin was a, a smaller up and coming shop. It was his first NBS show. And, you know, uh, my brother, actually wrote the order with him and talked to him. I didn't even meet him that first show. And and after he'd walked away, he told me who he was. And and he said, yeah, we're gonna start doing blue parts. And I kind of looked at my brother and said, what? He said, yeah, we're gonna make blue parts for them uh, because their colors are blue and we don't offer blue. Yeah. And I kind of just shrugged it off like it was nothing. And, you know, we made these blue parts for Austin. And next thing I knew, we were going down to Austin's grand opening or, or one year uh, celebration, I think it was. Yeah. And down there and did a parking lot event with him and um, started talking to him at the shows. And, uh, you know, I think 
think we'd done a couple of events and been around each other at a couple of shows. And I invited him on a, a whitetail hunt up at Legends Ranch. Yeah. And um, that's that's when we really became good friends. I spent that week up there in Michigan deer hunting. And uh, from then on, you know, we've we've gone on a lot of hunting trips together uh, here in the U.S. He came out here and bear hunted with me. And uh, we've done a lot of exotic hunts and pig hunts down in Texas and a few whitetail trips around around the U.S. And um, just our whole relationships pretty much grounded on that that hunting trip and uh, both of our passions for getting out and hunting. I mean, we work together and, and have a good business relationship, but the friendship really was developed out in the woods. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's typically, you know, you hear that a lot within the industry of like, Hey, how'd you meet this person? How'd you meet this person? A lot of times it's, a lot of times it's the same thing. We're like, Hey, we met them at a show and we just kind of hit it off. We went hunting together and like, there are there are lifelong friendships that are formed based on just like that activity alone just going on a hunt and spending the weekend whether it's out you know hanging out by the grill drinking a beer before or after the hunt you know um so that's cool that's awesome to hear now into more of a dive into like your personal life you do a lot of i'm told you do a lot of bear hunting uh, a lot of elk hunting my that's where I'm curious because I'm down here in Texas. I do a lot of pig hunting, a lot of deer hunting, white-tailed deer, axis deer. Um, I have yet, it's on my, it's on my bucket list, but I have yet to do any of these, uh, as far as like your bear, your elk hunts. And I got some questions for you. I just bear hunting in general, I'm guessing we're talking black bear, right? Yep. Have you hunted grizzly bear? No, I haven't. Um, we we don't have a season for grizzly right. uh, here, and you know I don't even know that the the fishing game would say that there there are grizzly bear here. I mean, there may be a few up in northeast Oregon around Idaho, but they'd be few and far between. And I don't think they live here. They may kind of come in back and forth. So sure, uh, I've never been to Alaska. Um, a Kodiak brown bear hunts, you know, on my bucket list up there in Alaska, but. Um, I've never even seen a grizzly bear uh, in the wild. You know, yeah. seen them at do, but well, I just uh, know. I just know when you talk about when you think about bear hunting, most people are looking into black bear, but grizzly is an option. But I'm telling people, I have done some research on it, like just trying because it's one of my one of my things. Like I want to do it eventually. Price wise, like if you're thinking about maybe you know getting into bear hunting start off with your black bear because you're it, the grizzly is significantly more expensive uh you're looking at like at least 10 grand uh, from what i can tell uh on being able to get s- even started with hunting a grizzly bear so for you i want to focus on black bear if there's somebody if you were going to explain to somebody like how to get started with a black bear hunt let's say somebody from outside of oregon maybe that's going to take a trip up there to bear country and and hunt up there how would they do that what what are some things that they need to just plan on doing yeah so i mean oregon um is a little different than a lot of the western states on how we have to black bear hunt uh here we're not allowed to use dogs and we're not allowed to bait oh really Uh, okay so you know a lot of the the oregon bear hunting comes in the spring um the bears come out of hibernation they're really active they need to eat they're eating lots of grass and grubs and um just foraging for food um most of the bears that that are carnivorous haven't quite became to the point where they want to eat a lot of meat they mostly want to to get uh kind of lighter things on their stomach so in oregon um we do a lot of spring bear hunting just glassing clear cuts and so you know um preparation for what to do on coming out west uh bear hunting uh the biggest thing i think people aren't going to realize is the difference in the lay of the land compared to what's down in texas or maybe uh in the midwest i mean it is extreme mountainous country where the bears live gotcha uh and you're usually packing out pretty hard and um i think the majority of people have came from out of state to come hunt with me their biggest surprise was just the the terrain and um the physical commitment bear hunting takes yeah yeah 
Yeah, I've heard that before. Um, along with obviously elk hunting, which you have to be, a, I've, you have to be in tremendous like physical shape to be able to even hang with most of those guys who might be stalking for days on a time. It's a little different with bear hunting, though, right? Usually, you know, you could do a successful bear hunt within, you know, four to six hours, right, of walking out yeah. there, glassing find one and then you'd have to approach it and be able to take your your ethical shot right yeah you know i've i've been bear hunting spring bear hunting here in oregon we have a spring season and we have a fall season um and from my experience people are typically more successful in the spring gotcha uh the fall bear tag in my opinion is more along the lines of i'm out deer hunting or elk hunting and i saw a bear and i have a tag for it and i, I harvested it where you know springtime there's not much else but turkeys and people yeah. are out targeting bears um but you know in, in that springtime um because of my knowledge and the time i've been doing it uh, i think it's been a couple years since i've gone out on a spring bear hunt and not seen a bear yeah, um yeah that so you know with uh you know different elk hunts um depending on where you are can be more challenging um based on the the population and and the terrain but um if you learn to know what a bear likes to be in in the springtime and you know where to look for them right it it becomes pretty easy to find them yeah um now, seeing a bear, a black bear, and a green clear cut a mile away and finding it and killing it are two different things. Right. Um, that comes the stock in, in the hunt. but Because um, they can smell really well, right? They can, yep. Yeah. Yep, and you would not believe how fast a bear is running through a clear cut. <laughs> they can get going on that rough terrain but you know i i think for someone getting into hunting um and getting into bear hunting when you just go out in the spring and you find green clear cuts and you just look with your binoculars you know some people go out and and don't see a whole lot but they just use their eyes yeah um, and it, what you can find when you actually look through some some glass yeah yeah absolutely well so what caliber do you use for for your black bear hunts you know i'm a huge fan of a 300 win mac okay. uh, my dad got uh, a model 70 when i graduated high school and and that's really my go-to gun um out here no matter what game uh but with bears they're big and they're tough and they don't bleed a whole lot so um you know you really don't want to be tracking a wounded bear right and the they don't bleed it makes it even harder to track one um and so i'm i'm a huge fan of 30 cal and bigger um okay now that can't be done with something smaller my daughter killed her first bear at nine years old with a 6.5 grendel okay uh and so shot placement is really important um but i've seen guys shoot a bear with a 300 wind mag and it runs off through the clear cut and now you're damn uh thick brush truck and a wounded bear right and, which is not uh, something you probably want to <laughs> come upon <laughs> yeah it, it gets exciting i mean i've never had a bad encounter um tracking a bear but it's definitely in the back of your mind and your your heart races a little bit when you're doing it yeah. um but you know uh shot placement just like any game animal is is crucial yeah so uh, i like big guns with a well placed shot and they you know you can usually break it down a bear down real well and and make a, a quick uh harvest yeah you, it's funny you talk about uh you know oregon you're not allowed to bait there i i didn't even know that but i'd heard stories of like other places where you can bait um yeah. guys will set up like a tree stand or something and these bears are they're naturally curious animals and the bears have actually started to like climb up the tree to see like what's this dude doing up here what is this thing up in this tree and yeah. these, these hunters have kind of been like well what do i do now I shoot him right underneath me or you know <laughs> but uh yep yeah. my dad and bro uh used to bait here in oregon and and i was with them but i was too young to to hunt um and it was early 90s when they changed the laws where you couldn't do that but i've hunted over bait uh in other states and i mean it is pretty cool to be up in a tree stand and have a bear you know 30 to 50 yards um 
And, you know, my favorite thing about being a stand is just being so close to those animals. And, and typically if you're quiet and you have good scent coverage, they're unaware of you. Yeah. And so be up and close and, and really observe them uh, naturally. Right. Yeah. Um, now, when it comes to when it comes to black bear, and I'm 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 assuming this is for just bears in general. I have heard that, and I've have had plenty of bear meat, but someone else has always prepared it for me. I've heard when you cook them, um, you have to make sure that is you have to get them well done. Is that accurate? Because they have the meat has trigonosis in it a lot of times, right? Yeah, it can. So you have to make sure it's cooked well. Um, Almost all of our bear meat goes into a breakfast sausage. Oh, really? Okay. So it's just a just a ground uh, breakfast sausage with pork fat and spices, um, and we'll we'll use it for all kinds of things. My dad makes an incredible chili out of it, um, but uh, that that's our favorite way to eat it. Uh, I've had a lot of bad bear meat. And in my opinion, that typically comes from the preparation long before cooking, um, just in the gutting and the skinning and uh, cleaning process. And right. with bear meat, it's really important to get all the fat off. Uh, typically, your fat and game animals is not good like it is in beef. Right. And bears, it, it really just kind of sours the meat. And when you skin a bear, um, typically you then go back and you skin a whole layer of fat off of it. Um, I, you know, I've killed lots of bears where when it's skinned out, it looks just like a white uh, marshmallow <laughs> sitting there because, you know, they're completely covered in fat. Yeah. Uh, especially all as they're gearing up for that winter. Sure. Um, so from my experience, you know, if you get that fat off of it and you get the meat chilled um, and clean as soon as possible, bear meat can be really good um, no matter how you're going to cook it or your steaks yeah. uh, but we found that the sausage is kind of hard to beat yeah sure well so b- going back to you know w- when you're glassing and looking for a bear there, are you guys allowed to use thermals when you do that up there so Oregon's made a, a, a huge effort to, to prevent the use of thermals gotcha. um they recently uh, reworded the, the regulations um, that says it's it's not lawful to use um, thermal image technology uh, for the purpose of hunting or scouting game animals. Gotcha. Uh, you know, uh, so in theory, it is not legal. Um, you can legally use uh, a thermal to recover animals in Oregon and um, I I personally think how they wrote it is is kind of a gray area right um, so if you're out bear hunting with a thermal in your hand over a clear cut you're you're probably in violation of the law right uh, but I think it kind of leaves it up to the officer's discretion right on uh, what's legal and what's not legal. Um, so I really don't have a good answer for you on that. Uh, I, I don't think I can sit here and say it's illegal because uh, I don't think the regulations clearly define um, what you can and cannot do. Sure. Well, the good news is in about 10 years, the, the kids that are coming up now could just say they couldn't read the law. Because I think I just heard I just heard yesterday that Oregon had uh, done away with requirements for reading and, and math to graduate high school. So I'm like, oh well, in ten years from now, we're gonna have you know a lot of fun with those people. But yeah. <laughs> uh, that's on a whole well, different that, that's on a well, whole different topic of things, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, the reason I the reason I had mentioned it is because um, there is some mountainous areas here in Texas. And when I say mountainous, they're nothing like what you guys are dealing with. I'm talking the Rocky Hills at best. But uh, I've done some I've done some uh, ram hunting out there, and that took a lot of just glassing hillsides, and um, it it was incredibly more easy to pinpoint something. Um, with with the thermal obviously just because like oh there's you know there's a heat signature right there um 
which was pretty pretty cool for Ram because they actually blend in extremely well with the scenery. Um, Black Bear are going to be a little bit different. And I know that you know Black Bear come in all kinds of different colors, um, not just black. Um, but it made it a lot easier for the ram hunting. But I can see, you know, I'm not going to get mad at Oregon for saying that you can't use it because I do understand it. It makes it so much easier, and it, it sounds like the state is just trying to make it, um, you know, give the, the animal as big a chance as you can. I mean, you can't bait them. You can't use thermals uh, to locate them. And so, you know, I get that aspect of it, um, you know, from my point of view. What – how does how does elk hunting differ from your bear hunting? Oh, I mean it's it's night and day difference uh, for me. You know, I'm I'm primarily an archery elk hunter. Okay. Uh, so for me, uh, archery elk hunting, it's it's a lot of bow tech. I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, I do have a tech bow. Um, you know, it's a lot of hiking and. Um, locate bugles um calling um because then the the elk are in the rut um and so you know for me uh typically i'm bear hunting with a rifle and glassing and and looking for a bear a long ways away to make an approach on where um bow hunting i you know if i can hear an elk i don't even care if i can see it um or you know i i don't use my binoculars a, a whole lot when i'm bow hunting um because an elk pretty much pops out for me at a thousand plus yards. Um, and so a bear is, um, for me, a, a whole different animal uh, on how I approach them. Um, there may be some similarities in, in rifle hunting just with uh, out west through all animals. You, sp- you spend a lot of time glassing yeah. and then hunting after you've located that animal in clear cuts or or up in uh, glades and um, for me it's just night and day difference uh, on the animal because one I'm trying to be vocal with and another one I'm just trying to find with my eyes and uh, you know uh, an elk um, in my opinion has has more of a um, weariness to their their sense of smell when it comes to humans you know uh you can be 50 yards from an elk and and it smell you and it runs over the next hill where i've been around bears before and they smell you and and maybe they don't like it or maybe they kind of are aware of you but i you know i've haven't ever been on a bear hunt where the wind and my scent just completely blew the whole hunt yeah Uh, but i have seen elk at 400 yards get my scent before and run over the next mountain Wow, uh, but yeah, it, to me it's it's completely different. Uh, the only thing that would stay the same is it kind of seems like they both love to live in the most rugged, nasty place you can find. <laughs> yeah, well, so how does it work with with bow hunting and elk? You you are going to spot them or at least call and see if you can get a reaction so you can hear them. And then you have to physically make a determination of where you're going to walk to, to get into cover. I'm guessing on the ground to call them in to you. Right. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I'm by no means an an expert elk hunter. I've had a lot of opportunities and some success. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just a whole chess match. Um, if you if you locate a, a bull off of seeing or hearing it, um, depending on the wind direction and the lay of the land and what direction he's headed, you're going to make a game plan to try to get in as close as you can and call him to you. Um, but, you know, uh, you're not going to catch an elk if he's walking away. Right. Uh, and so it... it it is a whole chess match and the guys that have done it a bunch uh are more successful because they found all the ways to not do it yeah uh and you know when i was first getting into elk hunting um by myself uh after high school and going out and and i'm blessed to be able to just go out in the the woods out my back door or back then when i lived at my folks house out their back door um and i had a lot of close encounters with bulls and I never got to shoot. And, and most of the time, never even got my bow drawn back. And uh, a very successful archery elk hunter told me, Tyler, you just need to stack failures. 
Right. And it, you stack a hundred failures, you'll kill your first bull. Yep. And he said, it might take you another hundred failures to kill your second bull. <laughs> and he, and he, or 120, but he said, you know, if you keep stacking these failures, you'll get to a point where, you know, maybe every eight to 12 um, encounters, there's a shot opportunity. Right. Um, so even the guys that are really good at it can't see a bull walk over and kill it. Right. Um, it's still a game and an elk are uh, at least big, especially big bulls. Um, they're big for a reason. Right. And th- th- they've probably been hunted before and, and they've played that chess match before. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I would think that you talk about stack up a hundred failures and, you know, at the end of that, maybe you get one, maybe you get one before, maybe you have to get 150 failures. I don't know. Just keep, keep going until you've done it successfully. And along the way you learn what to do and what not to do. Um, that's got to make it like so much better when you're actually successful because instead of just okay i'll use hogs as an example down here i can go out tonight and shoot 30 hogs and i know i can and it's like at the end of the day would i much rather spend you know an entire season chasing after one thing um and and have that feeling of accomplishment when I'm actually able to achieve that. And then over time, you know, if you go out and shoot 30 hogs every night, eventually you just become numb to it and it could still be fun, but that sense of accomplishment is not necessarily, you know, there. So I, to me, that seemed like, how did it feel when you shot your first bull? Well, my, my first bull was uh, a solo hunt where I, I'd, I'd spotted them. Uh, bedded down and I snuck down to them and, and hit a few cow calls and they came in and um, you know hunting is a huge part of my life and and I uh, can easily get emotional because of hunting and especially with my kids but man I I, uh, I watched that bull fall down and uh, the first thing I did was pulled my phone out and called my dad yeah. and, and about my success and and then after I got off that call I just laid back and, and cried just looked up at the sky and you know thank God for the opportunity but it, it's definitely a, a flood of emotions and you know it, it took years of stacked failures um, to, to be successful yeah that's, um, that's awesome so it's cool you know and, and the vast majority of archery hunters um, are not successful for elk year in and year out yeah. um, it is that chase and that, um, you know, that, that goal of, okay, maybe this year I get my bull. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the guys that are successful, um, put a ton of time into scouting, put a ton of time into planning their hunt, work their ass off hunting, you know, 10 and 15 miles a day in the wilderness. Um, and they've spent years stacking failures. So now they know how to do it. But, you know, I don't know any successful elk hunter that just goes out on the weekend and kills a bull. Sure. Um, it's the guys that, you know, know the, know the ground, know the animal and know how those animals um, move and react and where they bed and where they feed. And, um, you know, you really have to have all your stars aligned to, to kill a bull with, with a bow. Um, and you know, the, the people that don't stack those hundred failures, um, to kill one typically have, uh, someone there showing them how it's done and calling the bull in for them because, you know, there's a lot of people that get, get the opportunity to kill bulls their first few years hunting because they have a good friend that took them out and they said, okay, go stand next to that tree. Right. And that stacked all those failures to bring the bull right up next to them. Right. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, well, and then you have a a whole nother side of, of hunting, which is, um, you know, your Africa hunts, which I think, uh, judging by my conversation with Austin, you guys just got back from Africa, right? Like, um, let's see, what was that? Maybe two and a half months ago or so. Uh, we got back right at the end of April. Okay. Uh, Well, he, he told me you guys did awesome over there. I mean, um. What was the hunt like? Yeah, you know, it was, it was incredible. I um, I'd never been out of the country. Um, 
and Austin had been there previously. Uh, he, he tried to get me to go last year and it just couldn't work out with my schedule and, or I get years ago. And then last year we got this trip planned and, uh, I was in Las Vegas and he called me and said, turn your TV onto the news. And there was the, the South African president saying their country was shut down. No one was allowed in, uh, because of COVID. Yeah. And so I got pushed off, um, I think a little over a year. And so there was a lot of anticipation building up to it. Um, me being an archery hunter, I initially said, I'm, I'm taking a bow. And I, you know, I got a new bow, got it all dialed in, um, and had these plans to bow hunt and had this list of these things I wanted to bow hunt. And you know, as, as things evolved and not being able to go for a year, and finally, when we got the green light to go, um, everyone's uh, kill lists had changed uh, multiple times. And um, I got to the point where I, I didn't want to screw around with my bow. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to make sure my trip over there goes easy. I don't want to deal with customs and taking my bow. And that's my first time going out of the country. I don't want to deal with all that stuff. Right. Uh, and so I, you know, I just flew over there with Austin and showed up and the, the outfitter there had a rifle for me. And, you know, I think it was the best decision uh, I could have made um, for my first time because I didn't have that worry. And then while, while we were there, uh, the first week, Austin and I spent some time going around to the, to the different provinces targeting specific animals. And then uh, the last week joined up with the group there at Wow Africa at their lodge. And um, I think out of the 11 people there, I don't think there was a single person that would say it wasn't the trip of a lifetime. Yeah, absolutely. No, it sounded it sounded amazing. And just in case there's people listening to this podcast that had not heard the one that I recorded with Austin, tell me a little bit about what you guys shot. Yeah, so, I mean, um, the, the game there um, was incredible. I mean, there, there hadn't been people there hunting for, you know, 18 months. Um, and if you just think about all the trophies, piece from a year and a half ago they just got uh, that much bigger and there were more fawns and um, any of the animals that would have been harvested would have been gone and so uh, the 11 people there uh, uh, took 120 trophies and uh, there was a wide range of different animals so a lot of them um, were your common um, uh, planes game um, but I was fortunate enough to take uh, 15 species uh, and I got um, a black impala and a white flanked impala and then also my common impala um, so that was was cool I was able to harvest a golden wildebeest um, and a blue wildebeest and, and that golden wildebeest was incredible you know uh, the only wildebeest I'd ever seen was on the Lion King yeah and thought they were just going to be this big dumb animal um and, and i was interested in the golden wildebeest just because of the uniqueness uh, i thought they're beautiful um but hunting the golden wildebeest i i really d developed a respect for the blue wildebeest i mean they they have um, great senses and they're extremely skittish and what i thought was just this big dumb animal is actually this uh animal that that provides a really cool hunt and a neat chase uh, because they're they're not easy to just stock up on. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Um, yeah, he had told me that you guys had had shot quite a few, and that a lot of the for those who don't know, a lot of the the meat of whatever they harvest over there actually went to the local communities to help them out, and it was dearly, dearly needed. You talk about a country that had been on complete lockdown for a year and a half, um, and a country that kind of, uh, those local communities thrive on those tourists um interactions whether it was hunts or you know photographers coming over um the revenue that those things take into those communities is vital to them so they were 
ec- ecstatic to have you guys come back in and, and be able to, uh, one, provide some income and then two, some meat to uh, the local communities there. I do have a question that I didn't ask Austin, which is, um, are you going to get any mounts out of this stuff? Yeah. You know, um, almost all all the animals will, will be brought back here and then uh, mounted here in the U.S. But to touch back on the meat thing, you know, um, I, I'd heard a lot of different things about what happens to meat over there. And, um, you know, it was really neat with WOW Africa. They have a, a meat uh, processing facility there uh, on site. And so um, we had the opportunity to eat our game meet every night and they had this big chalkboard over the table um and so you know it said austin's ostrich or you know josh's impala so every night you came in and and it it was a sense of pride when it was your name up there and your animal that yeah. everyone was having and we did uh we did harvest i think about a dozen animals austin and i that we strictly harvested for meat donation to the community and uh at the end of the hunt we were able to present the community with that and they were very gracious um and that still left a lot of meat there on uh you know there in the facility and and wow takes that and processes it and and does take it to the the meat market and that's another source of revenue for them um and then some of the meat also stays there at wow and um you know wow employs several dozen uh, community members and so you know they feed their employees while they're there and they're able to have that for clients and things like that so the i've had that same question about well what what do you do with all the meat um and and the reason i wanted to touch back on that is because i i don't believe a single piece of meat goes to waste right uh it is all all consumed by people that really need it um and, and it it was neat to provide those that community with those animals that austin and i uh purposely got for donation to them and, and they were extremely gracious to have meat because typically they eat corn um the their only source of food is corn and they they make it into bread and they make it into a thing kind of like grits and um you know, uh, if you're just eating bowls of mashed corn every single day, a piece of red meat is pretty nice. Yeah, absolutely. I could imagine. Yeah, I don't go, I don't go a couple hours without eating some red meat these days. <laughs> yeah, uh, I but- couldn't imagine that. <laughs> uh, but hey, we've got just a few minutes left here. So what I wanted to do was just kind of give you a plug. Um, where can people go to find out more about Timber Creek Outdoors? Maybe there's some extra people out there with some plain black Bushmasters they picked up at Academy they need to upgrade. Or, I my in my case, my wife wants an AR-15 really bad. She will not accept a straight flat black gun or dark earth or anything. She wants a robin egg. She wants something with robin egg. So what I'm going to be ending up doing is probably getting one of your kits that are, I saw you got robin egg on there. In fact, my boss actually has one of your kits in his office right now. That is robin egg. And uh, I I sent her a picture of it and she was like, oh yeah, I I need one of those. So we're probably going to be doing that. If people need to go find more information about you, What's your website, social media, if you got them, um, best way to contact you guys? Yeah, for sure. So, the, you know, the best way to, in my opinion, to learn about Timber Creek in today's day and age is look at Facebook and Instagram. I mean, if you you want to see what kind of parts we have, there's, there's hundreds of pictures there um, from customers who've built their guns and they're really proud of them uh, or from pictures that we we post of uh, cool guns that we have around here and in the shop but you know um, figure out what you want with the ARs you can have a pistol you can have a rifle you can have a gun that shoots a thousand yards so you know people always say to me what kind of AR should I build well figure out what what you're going to use it for and then you know scroll through the pictures and and decide what you want it to look like do you want it purple or do you want it black or do you want it uh, fde and um you know once you really have a good idea of what you want you can go to our website timbercreekoutdoorsinc.com 
and uh, we have a dealer locator there. Uh, you know, my opinion on the best way to get into Timber Creek is go into your local gun shop that has it and visit with them about it because they're the professionals can help you with everything. Uh, but if there isn't a local dealer, uh, we do have a sales portion of the website where you can order directly from us. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Well, uh, Tyler, man, I want to thank you for the time today. Uh, I know we've been trying to get this together for some time. And so I appreciate you being able to carve out this time for me. Um, and man, just keep on doing what you're doing. Uh, keep on doing more hunts. Maybe I'll have you on. Hopefully I'll have you on in the future where we can just touch back on some new hunts that you've been going on, um, new experiences and stuff like that. So, uh, I'm going to keep you in the pipeline for later on and just keep killing it, man. 